Distinguished guests, friends and colleagues, welcome to the SISC Mumbai Conference. On behalf of the Singapore International Arbitration Center, we are very pleased to have your company this evening. My name is Shweta Viduri, as the head of South Asia. I'm pleased to welcome you all and I'm, as the host of the evening. The theme for today's conference is Current Choices and Emerging Trends in International Arbitration. Without further ado, I'd like to invite our CEO, Ms. Gloria Lim, to deliver the welcome address. Gloria, please. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Singapore International Arbitration Center, I am delighted to extend a very warm welcome to today's conference. Today's conference is a special one. It is our very first in-person conference in India since the pandemic. And it is heartwarming to see so many of you here to join us on this occasion. We had initially booked a smaller room, but uh, have since moved the conference to the bigger room to accommodate the numbers. So from the bottom of our hearts, we would like to thank you for your support and the trust you have placed in us. I would also like to express my sincere thanks and appreciation to our sponsors, eminent speakers, and the SIC board and court members who have made time to be here today. The theme of today's conference is current choices and emerging trends in international arbitration. The challenges posed by the pandemic over the past two years have had a profound impact on the practice of international arbitration. Many disputes practitioners I've spoken to over the recent months have shared that notwithstanding the limitations on travel, they have remained very busy and international arbitration cases have continued to proceed, leveraging technology and digital communication means. This suggests that international arbitration has become even more relevant as a means through which corporations have sought to manage cross-border business conflicts while protecting and expanding their business interests overseas. Corporations have also become more sophisticated in their dispute management strategies, often leveraging the salient features of international arbitration to achieve more cost and time effective means of dispute resolution. This has served to drive the variety of developing trends in international arbitration, which we will discuss today including the development and proliferation of innovative mechanisms offered by international arbitration institutions. On our part, SIAC seeks to do our best to support businesses and commercial parties in the resolution of disputes by focusing on speed, quality, efficiency, and a personal level of service in administration of arbitration cases. In 2021, SIAC saw its third highest caseload with 469 new case filings and total sum in dispute of US dollars 6.54 billion. Indian parties have remained among our top foreign users alongside foreign users from the other leading global economies. We are humbled by the support our users have given us and will continue to work hard to meet their expectations. Behind the scenes are many stories of how the SIAC Secretariat and the members of the SIAC Court of Arbitration have worked tirelessly to respond to the needs of its users. To share an example, SIAC recently administered a high-value complex matter where SIAC was called upon to appoint an emergency arbitrator. It was our 131st 
Emergency Arbitrator application. The SIC Secretariat and our President Lucy worked quickly to take a decision on the application and the emergency arbitrator was appointed in seven hours. Two weeks later, the emergency arbitrator rendered a 45-page interim order, which was scrutinized by the SIC Secretariat and to transmit it to the parties on the same day. This nimbleness and flexibility has been a hallmark of SIC's case management for many years. And almost every week, we accommodate various requests from parties or tribunals to expedite processes to meet requirements they have agreed upon in the procedural schedule. We want to make sure that SIC continues to write these good stories and help parties to resolve their disputes. Last of all, I would like to say that there's just so much we can and will do together going forward. Our greatest achievement is the trust that our users all over the world place in us, and we owe our standing in the global arbitration community today, in large part to our users and friends in India. With your continued partnership, collaboration and support, we are determined to deliver even higher levels of service, quality and efficiency. I look forward to working closely with everyone and ask for your continued support. Please do not hesitate to reach out to us if you have ideas, thoughts and feedback on what SIAC can and should do to better serve the needs of the industry and arbitration community. Before I hand over the floor to Professor Yen Paulson, whose keynote speech is very much awaited, I would like you to block your calendar and save the date for our annual India conference on the 12th of November in New Delhi. So on that note, I again welcome you all and I look forward to a productive evening ahead. Thank you, everyone. I would like to invite Professor Jan Paulsen to deliver the much-awaited keynote speech titled The Single Most Important Thing in International Arbitration. Professor Paulsen, please. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be with you uh, this evening and have the occasion to try to prove to you that we can agree on what not the most single most important thing in international arbitration, the single most important thing to understand about international arbitration. We should always aim high, shouldn't we? Uh, on the way over here, I noticed that meetings had started in a number of other rooms before we did, and there were other speakers uh, talking about um, selling insurance, selling refrigerators, and in one room, it sounded interesting, but they were selling something mysterious. I'm not sure it was, and it occurred to me it could be fun one day if we take all of the speakers' names around and put them in a hat and then send them to different rooms depending on what comes out of the hat. Then you could hear about the mysterious things that I, I really wasn't able to seize. But um, the single import, I will not keep you in suspense, the single thing which is the most important thing to understand about international arbitration is that international arbitration is not arbitration. That's the title of a lecture I gave in Canada 15 years or so, and this evening you'll hear me giving a, something of an update uh, of my uh, thinking there. I will convince you very quickly um, in uh, a couple of ways. The first way will take 30 seconds. Um, and for those of you who want to be even more convinced, uh, that will take two minutes. And the remaining time I will use simply to try to explain why, in my view, and I hope yours, uh, it is important uh, to be aware of that single most important thing. Um, so, international arbitration isn't arbitration. Do you think a sea elephant is an elephant? 
international arbitration is something different. I went, once went to uh, Greenland and I met the queen of the sea elephants and she told me that in the history of the universe, no sea elephant had ever met a single elephant. Uh, they walk different paths. And so international arbitration walks a different path than arbitration. It's a fact that my first arbitration when I came out of law school, um, and I started right away working in, uh, in international arbitration, was almost 50 years ago, September 1975. And I've never been in an arbitration ever since then. Um, and I can't remember how many international ones I've been in. I had a friend once in Paris who, uh, in his business, uh, he was um, in the movie production business, he had an, an arbitration, a French national arbitration involving the cinema industry. And he told me what happened to him and I, had, I just was clueless and mystified uh, by what went on there. And so would you if you had the details of that. Um, so that's the 30 second demonstration. Now, the slightly longer one, a couple of minutes, that, because that, that you might think that was a bit tedious. That was just um, lexicographically or zoologically um, a, a, a little bit of, of logic, which is just a matter of terminology. But how about some compelling logic? The most important thing about international arbitration is not important at all in arbitration. Now, if we can make good on that, I think we've got, got a little bit further down the road to conviction in this respect. Um, if two things are so fundamentally different in their nature that the absolute primacy in one is irrelevant to the other, we really should be careful about putting them in the same box. Why is this important? You may have attended many conferences where the advantages and disadvantages of arbitration are discussed and the practice of arbitration. And uh, you hear the subject arbitration versus litigation. I think they're going a little bit out of style because it's, it's, it's um, uh, such uh, well-treaded ground. Uh, is arbitration quicker or not? Is it less expensive or the contrary? Um, how important is confidentiality and how does it really work? Um, is the informality and the confidentiality of a nature to make it less disruptive in the life of, of commercial businesses? Uh, do you get more correct uh, outcomes uh, because of arbitrators selected for specific expertise? Well, these are all debates to be had about arbitration uh, and some of it is also present at international arbitration. but well, not the big point. Um, in national arbitration, it's always a comparison. Which do you prefer, courts or arbitration? Uh, in international arbitration, it is very different. It is quite frequent that you have this somewhat unusual situation that the solution to the forum to resolve any dispute preferred by one party, absolute number one, is the absolute bottom of the pile for the other party, and vice versa. What am I talking about? Each other's courts. That gives you a hint of what is the important thing, which is neutrality. Neutrality is always the key. In arbitration, neutrality is presumed it is not something that needs to be strived for in this sense uh, of nationality. There should be nothing in a national arbitration process which means that there is prejudice against one party. So net neutrality is always the key and uh, that is the beginning and the end of it. And people who hold the view that I don't really, I'm not really keen on arbitration, but I certainly prefer it to the courts of my adversary is quite, uh, is, is quite common. Now, neutrality also blends into uh, the questions of language, which is something I hadn't thought about that much when I've addressed this topic. Um, in uh, Singapore and in India, you have the advantage that universal language or 
quite universal language English is used uh, uh, in, uh, in the courts, so you don't have that problem there. But other countries face a difficulty in that regard. And if you had told me 20 years ago that the proud French with their culture and their literature and their science and their great legal scholars would one day agree that you could use English in French courts, I'm not talking about arbitration, in French courts, um, I would have told you that you were um, dreaming. Yet today, in France, there has a degree has passed saying that in commercial courts, English may be used. I've asked some of my colleagues in, in France how often this happens and how that works out, uh, and um, the answer is gradually. The principle has been acquired, you can do this, uh, but the process is gradual because you do have to, how do you feel about presenting a case in English to a tribunal of three if you're not quite sure that they're getting the nuances? So that's why it's gradual. There will be a different generation uh, of uh, judges who think this is a natural thing, something that I thought Fran French parliament would never accept, uh, and yet that is what's, what's happening there. Uh, in the country where I live now, uh, Bahrain, um, a couple of years ago, a, motion, a, a movement was started and has now resulted in decrees in Bahrain saying that, I'm talking about commercial cases. Bahrain has become a legally bilingual place in the courts, so that courts can be heard in English if the contract is in English and the parties so desire. It's quite a big change, uh, and, and it recognizes, I think, this feeling that neutrality is extremely important for people who uh, have different nationalities, and if you can find a neutral language, it's, uh, it's, it's something of an achievement. Why is it uh, important to be aware of this at all times? Uh, in the international environment, International arbitration often seems to be the only game, something of uh, a de facto monopoly. The parties could, conceivably, achieve neutrality by adopting a forum clause which refers to the courts of a third country, which has no connection with the parties or with the transaction. But how do we know that the courts of that country would accept jurisdiction? And there is no certainty in most cases that they would, and there is a certainty that they wouldn't in many others, um, where uh, the position is we have enough controversies of our own. Uh, it is something that uh, is paid for by the taxpayers, and why should for foreigners come here and have, here have their disputes heard and then complain from the loser uh, that they weren't happy with what happened? So we know that uh, London takes all comers, uh, in New York, we'll hear cases that have no connection with New York, but those are exceptions. So it's, uh, uh, it's a unique phenomenon. The unique phenomenon of international arbitration is, of course, something that must be evaluated continuously and critically. If the door is, open to lef uh, if the door is left open to abuse, sharp reactions will follow and they may harm a very valuable tool in maintaining confidence in international commercial transactions. At any rate, the reason to insist that international arbitration is not arbitration is that we could live without arbitration. Countries A, B, and C could take different views. A could encourage arbitration, arbitration. B could discourage it. C could even outlaw it. And then the result would be that disputes would be heard in courts. But if international arbitration were eliminated, international exchanges uh, would suffer immensely. And I, sub I submit nothing practical, nothing good would take its place. We're now used to different regimes for international arbitration. The ancestral model law's starting point was a proposal for a law to be applied to international commercial transactions. Different regimes. Uh, quite a remarkable example uh, of taking advantage of the model law was that of Cyprus, 
the lawyers in Cyprus and the government figured that it was positioned ideally between Europe and the Middle East as a neutral venue for arbitrations, uh, but most people outside Greece and Cyprus have difficulty uh, with Greek because to them it's Greek. Uh, and therefore, knowing that uh, Cypriot lawyers are really quite good uh, uh, in English as a result of the colonial past and the continued education of, of Cypriot lawyers uh, in, uh, um, uh, uh, in England, uh, decided that they would adopt the model law entirely. I don't know if you remember what happened in the late 80s as the model law was promulgated and people started reacting to it, national legislatures. And you would hear people say, we adopted the model law, 98% of it. Well, that is not, that is just the beginning of the discussion because if somebody puts in the, if somebody takes out the word not, before we will not review the substance of arbitral awards is sort of a significant change, and to hear that that country 98% adopted the model law is not something particularly encouraging. The Cypriots said, um, we've adopted the model law. Not only that, even though all of our laws are promulgated in Greek, because that's our national language, um, we're not going to translate it. We're not going to have debates as to whether or not we have translated the text of the model law in a proper way. How do you do that when the Constitution says that the laws are in Greek? You have to be practical. The law is one paragraph long and says international arbitrations will be conducted in accordance with the rules in Annex A. And just copy it. Uh, other countries have come into trouble with translations which they say are 100% model law because different, different tra translators, of course, come up with different solutions. Uh, this is quite an advance. Let me take you back a bit. A century ago, uh, commercially, commercial arbitration, it seemed, was inherently national. Uh, a foreigner who accepted arbitration was entering into a foreign national system without the struts of an international law system. Uh, enforcement of a foreign arbitral award before the 20th century, as I can only imagine because I've never come across a reported case, uh, was even more difficult than the enforcement of foreign judgments because at least the latter was rendered by public officials, perhaps entitled to full faith and credit, whereas foreign arbitrators, although doubtless operating under a contractual mandate uh, susceptible to acknowledgement elsewhere, had no status under local law. This is what was to change, and this is what has changed in the last century. When the International Chamber of Commerce got its starts, months after the signing of the Treaty of Versailles in 1919, uh, the formally established uh, terms of peace uh, coincided with a time when arbitration was, from the very inception, one of its key purposes. Commerce is better than war, better. Commerce may impede war. You don't shoot the, golden, the goose that lays the golden egg. Confidence in international contracts is important. Neutral arbitration is a way to achieve that, and that was understood. By the early 1940s, the situation had developed to an extent that the New York courts reports, uh, I came across the report for the year 1943, uh, quoting a study, uh, disclose, I'm quoting, the comparative scarcity of sales contract cases despite the tens of thousands of sales transactions taking place daily in New York. Courts were apparently becoming irrelevant. In Europe as well, a Unidroit conference convened by European governments in Rome in 1928 to, to unify sales law was met with the observation that unification was already in place by uh, a process uh, engaging private groups. Uh, so participation by governments or legislatures was not necessary. It's amazing to think that arbitration had made such inroads in so little time. And all of this was before the days of the New York Convention. How could arbitration have been so successful? Now, keep that in mind as a mental time cap capsule. And I will jump forward to give you an illustration of how far and how arbitration can uh, uh, take place 
that is happening today. So uh, I'll give you an illustration which takes us into the world of sports, which as we all know, today is big business, a very large international industry. The international federations that rule sports in the world have generated a very interesting arbitral mechanism which has garnered the adhesion of more and more federations who cease running their own dispute resolution and join something called the Court of Arbitration for Sport in Lausanne. Uh, it's extremely active and the awards of arbitrators operating under its rules are given full and immediate effect. Now, what other arbitration institutions can say that and how does this happen? Full and immediate practical effect. If we're talking about disciplinary cases, it's easy to say why. An athlete who is suspended for doping uh, will simply not be given credentials. So as of that instance, the, the decision is in force because he cannot compete. The federations that organize the competitions adhere to regulations which accept CAS awards as the ultimate appellate decisions. How CAS also uh, achieves finality and efficacy with respect to contractual disputes is perhaps more interesting for this audience. I'll illustrate uh, with an example which I think you might find uh, entertaining and perhaps uh, interesting and worthy of reflection. Some years ago, a Brazilian football player signed a four-year contract to play for a premium division Mexican football club. It's not the same kind of money in Mexico in football as in other countries, but uh, it's uh, a passion of the Mexican public as well. And this player was a fairly good player, not somebody who was sought after by the large European clubs, uh, but he went to play in Mexico for a team called Los Tigres. He was paid, it's worthwhile remembering a couple of details, he was paid a uh, transfer bonus, we call it a golden handshake, of one million dollars, and was thereafter entitled under his contract to receive a monthly salary until the end of the fourth season. He began to play for the team, but after a year he was missing feijoada or Hyperenia, I don't know. He just went back to Brazil, and when time came to report for training for the following season, he just didn't come back. Uh, worse than that, he started to play for a Brazilian team again uh, and showed no inclination of returning. The International Federation, FIFA, immediately suspended him from playing worldwide. That's the effect of breaching your registered contract. Uh, within, a, within a few months, uh, a Brazilian labor court, seized by him or maybe his new Brazilian team, ruled that he was entitled to practice uh, his career as a matter of human rights to take employment and to support his family. Sounds very fundamental, doesn't it? This is in contradiction with the idea of sanctioning him for, uh, for breach of contract and, and suspending his right to play. Um, and so, with the Brazilian judgment in hand, uh, he signed with a Brazilian team known as Atlético Mineiro. You might imagine that Los Tigres felt hard done by. They had paid one million dollars in order to procure the services of this player for four years, not for one season. But, all right, all the lawyers in the room. What are you going to do now? How are Los Tigres going to be made whole? They had an employment contract with a player. True, it called for uh, a, a, an action in a court which was familiar to them, the Mexican court in the team where he had come to play and had taken up residence for that brief period. Uh, so uh, that court uh, rendered a judgment saying that the player was in breach of a contract and had to pay back the million dollars. Now what? Even uh, without any complicating factors, one cannot really ex expect that a Mexican judgment would be enforced or be, be declared enforceable readily by a Brazilian court without any problem, let alone 
practically that the player would conveniently have put his, uh, all of his earnings in a transparent um, bank account for the convenience of somebody seeking enforcement. So how, is, how are Los Tigres going to uh, be uh, made whole? Is there any possibility here? Well, now we have to understand this um, evolution, uh, this accretion of capacity in the arbitral system in the world of sport. And it works like this. Uh, you have the problem of the defaulting player. You have the problem of a decision by the Football Federation, international decision, and you have the problem of a Mexican judgment, which nobody is thinking about anymore because the Brazilian courts don't homologate it, to use the Portuguese word, and you have a Brazilian judgment, which in stirring terms says, as a matter of human rights, this man has a right to work. And so interfering with his right to work uh, is, is not acceptable, and the Mexican judgment uh, we're, we're not going to pay any attention to. Grim prospects for Los Tigres, would you think? But that was before consideration of the modern context uh, of the globalized football industry, which here serves as an example which we can imagine in other circumstances. Uh, first, uh, proceedings were held before the FIFA Players Committee. The player was found to have breached the contract and ordered to pay damages in the amount of a, of a million dollars. If he failed to pay, uh, Atletico Minero would be jointly liable with the player because they had breached the rules in engaging his services when he had an already internationally registered contract. Uh, the decision was challenged by the player and by Atletico Minero, the Brazilian team, before CAS, and arbitrators were duly appointed. This is the last resort. And our, uh, so the arbitration was conducted, full arguments were heard, uh, notably as to the interpretation of the Mexican employment contract and as to the principle of joint liability. Uh, as to the former, the arbitrators concluded that the damages should be, re should be reduced to 750 because that's three years when you didn't play multiply, uh, multiply by 250,000. Uh, so um, uh, as to uh, the uh, joint liability, the principle was crystal clear. The FIFA rules explicitly hold teams jointly liable for the breach of a prior contract committed by any player they choose to employ. Accordingly, the, if the player were to fail to pay the $750,000 within 30 days, Atletico Minero would be required to make the payment. Atletico Minero was not a rich team, but it could be counted on to do its best to find the money because it would otherwise face disciplinary action by the Brazilian National Federation in the form of a relegation from the Premier Division in, in Brazil. That's serious. Um, who could force the Brazilian National Federation to do that? Well, if the Brazilian Federation didn't do that, the Brazilian Federation would be taken before the international jurisdiction of CAS. The result then would be exclusion from international competition we're talking about Brazil not playing in the World Cup. Is the word inconceivable something of an understatement? And so you see how something that looks like a very unpromising situation by building on the mechanism of arbitration where we have something of a tension between the idea that somebody enters into a consensual contract, but this contract has ob obligations that go uh, beyond the position of the player himself because he will be affected by the obligations owed by uh, his team, the new team that he signs on to, by his national federation and by the national federation to the international system of enforcement. Now, uh, you will say, um, in, with respect to something which is, which is more generally interesting, isn't there a problem of public policy here? Uh, is the decision of CAS, whatever you think of the Brazilian judgment saying, don't touch the player, he has a right to earn a living, this is a elsewhere had no status under local law. This is what was to change, and this is what has changed in the last century. When the International Chamber of Commerce got its starts, months after the signing of the Treaty of Versailles in 1919, uh, the formally established 
uh, terms of peace uh, coincided with a time when arbitration was, from the very inception, one of its key purposes. Commerce is better than war, better. Commerce may impede war. You don't shoot the, golden, the goose that lays the golden egg. Confidence in international contracts is important. Neutral arbitration is a way to achieve that, and that was understood. By the early 1940s, the situation had developed to an extent that the New York courts reports, uh, I came across the report for the year 1943, uh, quoting a study, uh, disclose, I'm quoting, the comparative scarcity of sales contract cases despite the tens of thousands of sales transactions taking place daily in New York. Courts were apparently becoming irrelevant. In Europe as well, a uni droit conference convened by European governments in Rome in 1928 to, to unify sales law was met with the observation that unification was already in place by uh, a process uh, engaging private groups. Uh, so participation by governments or legislatures was not necessary. It's amazing to think that arbitration had made such inroads in so little time. And all of this was before the days of the New York Convention. How could arbitration have been so successful? Now, keep that in mind as a mental time cap capsule. And I will jump forward to give you an illustration of how far and how arbitration can uh, uh, take place that is happening today. So uh, I'll give you an illustration which takes us into the world of sports, which as we all know, today is big business, a very large international industry. The international federations that rule sports in the world have generated a very interesting arbitral mechanism which has garnered the adhesion of more and more federations who cease running their own dispute resolution and join something called the Court of Arbitration for Sport in Lausanne. Uh, it's extremely active, and the awards of arbitrators operating under its rules are given full and immediate effect. Now, what other arbitration institutions can say that, and how does this happen? Full and immediate practical effect. If we're talking about disciplinary cases, it's easy to say why. An athlete who is suspended for doping uh, will simply not be given credentials. So as of that instance, the, the decision is in force because he cannot compete. The federations that organize the competitions adhere to regulations which accept CAS awards as the ultimate appellate decisions. How CAS also uh, achieves finality and efficacy with respect to contractual disputes is perhaps more interesting for this audience. I'll illustrate uh, with an example which I think you might find uh, entertaining and perhaps uh, interesting and worthy of reflection. Some years ago, a Brazilian football player signed a four-year contract to play for a premium division Mexican football club. It's not the same kind of money in Mexico in football as in other countries, but uh, it's uh, a passion of the Mexican public as well. And this player was a fairly good player, not somebody who was sought after by the large European clubs, uh, but he went to play in Mexico for a team called Los Tigres. He was paid, it's worthwhile remembering a couple of details, he was paid a uh, transfer bonus call it a golden handshake, of $1 million, and was thereafter entitled under his contract to receive a monthly salary until the end of the fourth season. He began to play for the team, but after a year he was missing feijoada or caipirinha, I don't know. He just went back to Brazil, and when time came to report for training for the following season, he just didn't come back. Uh, worse than that, he started to play for a Brazilian team again, uh, and showed no inclination of returning. The International Federation, FIFA, immediately suspended him from playing worldwide. That's the effect of breaching your registered contract. Uh, within, a, within a few months, uh, a Brazilian labor court 
seized by him or maybe his new Brazilian team, ruled that he was entitled to practice uh, his career as a matter of human rights to take employment and to support his family. Sounds very fundamental, doesn't it? This is in contradiction with the idea of sanctioning him for, uh, for breach of contract and, and suspending his right to play. Um, and so, with the Brazilian judgment in hand, uh, he signed with a Brazilian team known as Atlético Mineiro. You might imagine that Los Tigres felt hard done by. They had paid $1 million in order to procure the services of this player for four years, not for one season. But, all right, all the lawyers in the room. What are you going to do now? How are Los Tigres going to be made whole? They had an employment contract with a player. True, it called for arbit uh, a, 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 an action in a court which was familiar to them, the Mexican court in the team where he had come to play and had taken up residence for that brief period. Uh, so uh, that court uh, rendered a judgment saying that the player was in breach of a contract and had to pay back the million dollars. Now what? Even uh, without any complicating factors, one cannot really ex expect that a Mexican judgment would be enforced or be, be declared enforceable readily by a Brazilian court without any problem, let alone practically that the player would conveniently have put his, uh, all of his earnings in a transparent um, bank account for the convenience of somebody seeking enforcement. So how, is, how are Los Tigres going to uh, be uh, made whole? Is there any possibility here? Well, now we have to understand this um, evolution uh, this accretion of capacity in the arbitral system in the world of sport. And it works like this. Uh, you have the problem of the defaulting player. You have the problem of a decision by the Football Federation, international decision. And you have the problem of a Mexican judgment, which nobody is thinking about anymore because the Brazilian courts don't homologate it, to use the Portuguese word, and you have a Brazilian judgment, which in stirring terms says, as a matter of human rights, this man has a right to work. And so interfering with his right to work uh, is, is not acceptable, and the Mexican judgment uh, we're, we're not going to pay any attention to. Grim prospects for Los Tigres, would you think? But that was before consideration of the modern context uh, of the globalized football industry, which here serves as an example which we can imagine in other circumstances. Uh, first, uh, proceedings were held before the FIFA Players Committee. The player was found to have breached the contract in order to pay damages in the amount of a, of a million dollars. If he failed to pay, uh, Atletico Minero would be jointly liable with the player because they had breached the rules in engaging his services when he had an already internationally registered contract. Uh, the decision was challenged by the player and by Atletico Minero, the Brazilian team, before CAS, and arbitrators were duly appointed. This is the last resort. And our, uh, the arbitration was conducted, full arguments were heard, uh, notably as to the interpretation of the Mexican employment contract and as to the principle of joint liability. Uh, as to the former, the arbitrators concluded that the damages should be, re should be reduced to 750 because that's three years when you didn't play multiply, uh, multiply by 250,000. Uh, so um, uh, as to uh, the uh, joint liability, the principle was crystal clear. The FIFA rules explicitly hold teams jointly liable for the breach of a prior contract committed by any player they choose to employ. Accordingly, if the player were to fail to pay the $750,000 within 30 days, Atletico Minero would be required to make a payment. Atletico Minero was not a rich team, but it could be counted on to do its best to find the money because it would otherwise face disciplinary action by the Brazilian National Federation. 
in the form of a relegation from the Premier Division in, in Brazil. That's serious. Um, who could force the Brazilian National Federation to do that? Well, if the Brazilian Federation didn't do that, the Brazilian Federation would be taken before the international jurisdiction of CAS. The result then would be exclusion from international competition. We're talking about Brazil not playing in the World Cup. Is the word inconceivable something of an understatement? And so you see how something that looks like a very unpromising situation by building on the mechanism of arbitration where we have something of a tension between the idea that somebody enters into a consensual contract, but this contract has ob obligations that go uh, beyond the position of the player himself because he will be affected by the obligations owed by uh, his team, the new team that he signs on to, by his national federation and by the national federation to the international system of enforcement. Now, uh, you will say, um, in, with respect to something which is, which is more generally interesting, isn't there a problem of public policy here? Uh, is the decision of CAS, whatever you think of the Brazilian judgment saying, don't touch the player, he has a right to earn a living, this is a matter of human rights, and we don't accept these kind of fines of the million dollars. Um, how does that play out? There's a tension between the Brazilian system's notion of the human right to employment uh, and the idea of participating in an internationally regulated sport. It's unavoidable. There's a tension. And how is it resolved? It's resolved in this way, um, that uh, the International Federation cannot impose itself in Brazil in a particular way, except to say that you can't play in the World Cup because that's what we are, we, that's, that's what we are operating. But if we take uh, a, a, another example, uh, there is, um, uh, in cyclism, you have many people competing in Spain. In Spain, there is a national law that says um, all doping infractions have to be decided by the Spanish courts. Um, an investigation of the legislative history of that French, uh, uh, that Spanish law shows that the Spanish parliament was very concerned that national sporting federations would be too lenient with athletes and therefore it had to go to court. This is not a fear at the level of international courts because it is, um, uh, it, it is acting in the interest of multiple parties including people who want uh, the offenders to be excluded. So what do you do in those circumstances? Uh, answer, if these cyclists wish to compete internationally, they have to obey the international rules. We will not, we cannot impose them in Spain. If Spain mandates the possibility for them to race in Sp Spain, they may be so. But they will not be considered to be take, taking part in international competitions, which in cycling is an annual event which, which, which results with results uh, that are for the, the champion of the year is the one who has won the most races and you will be limited to Spain and it makes no sense whatsoever. Those uh, cases have been uh, tried again and again and that's the way that system works. Those who um, fail to see that the law could embrace arbitration and yet protect the public interest, uh, fail to entertain the idea that uh, arbitration is not uh, the struggle against the law, but it's a tool in the development of its delivery system in response to globalization. I've just given you an example. Hundreds of lectures Thousands of learned disquisitions by judges and scholars have made us see how public policy can accommodate arbitration all the while limiting excesses and recognizing a difference between international public policy and national public policy and recognizing a difference in the practical effect of the more limited ambit of national public policy. 
we are surely on solid ground when we stake out the claim for the specific advantages of international arbitration. Uh, consider the um, stated purposes of the unimaginably ex ante successful New York Convention, which is after all a treaty conceived and promoted under the aegis of the UN. Consider the preamble of the widely used arbitration rules of UNCTRAL, which stresses the international community, uh, community's interest expressed in the form of a recommendation of the General Assembly of the United Nations in, in, in ensuring the, the development of the international arbitral device. Consider the UNCTRAL Secretary's report in 1984 explaining the objectives of the model law, which has had such enormous influence and which, which contains uh, everything that its critics uh, seek to prescribe, and much more which, uh, uh, which has been developed in scholarship and in practice ever since. But there are anti-arbitration forces, and I will conclude with some reflections on that. Uh, and here is where the importance of distinguishing between arbitration and international arbitration really come to force. Anti-arbitration forces in most countries are focused on arbitration. The danger is that in pursuing their um, reservations, indeed their um, dislike of various features which they perceive in the arbitral process, uh, they perhaps intentionally greatly harm international arbitration. Uh, in, I'll give you an example, in the United States, uh, the Congress recurrently, depending on who happened to be uh, uh, congressmen, senators, and, and, and uh, uh, members of the House of Representatives from time to time, take uh, a couple of, form, of forms. Uh, draft laws are proposed to, arbitra to exclude arbitration with respect to employment, consumer, and franchise dispute. Fine, we might say. Um, but one must view with alarm the fact that such proposals sometimes also exclude arbitration arising from relationships with unequal bargaining power. How far does that go? Um, one must also view with alarm the fact that such proposals would exclude, uh, would, would, uh, would have to investigate that subjective criterion and would apparently be an obstacle to international arbitration with the prospect of endless familiar disasters of discovery, depositions, and appeals slowly to determine whether there is sufficiently equality to allow even the international arbitration. Other critics of arbitration say that, um, well, in case decapitation doesn't work, why not carve up the body of arbitration with a thousand little scalpels? I'll give some examples. Exclude home building contracts. I don't know why. These are people with particular interests. Um, motor vehicle sales and leases. Livestock or poultry transactions. Employment contracts involving former members of the US or armed forces. I can't explain, I'm just telling you. Uh, and loans linked to federal tax refunds. Uh, once again, individual national systems may take a hostile view to arbitration or a very aggressive view in terms of limiting its ambit uh, on the basis that with respect to such questions only their courts can be, can be trusted. But this analysis in, is in opposite to international arbitration and would dismantle the valuable international system built around the New York Convention uh, on the enforcement and recognition of foreign awards. Do these legislators disagree with the points made by the President of the United States when he wrote to the U.S. Senate in April 68, transmitting the New York Convention and recommending accession to it. He wrote, experience under the Convention has established, this is 12 years after the New York Convention was available for signature, has established that it contributes in many ways to the promotion of international trade uh, and uh, investment. Still, those engaged in the international field would be mistaken if they, reflexive, if they reflexively join the fray on the side of arbitration each time it finds itself under attack. For all we know, in the particular country where the debate arises, arbitration has occasionally or perhaps even frequently been abused 
in a way that makes mockery of the consent of individuals, be they consumers, be they athletes, or members of a community dominated by sects. In such circumstances, international arbitration is the baby, and arbitration is the bathwater. We need to save the baby. If international arbitration is not arbitration, what should we call it? Let's see. We will, I suppose, go on calling the sea elephant sea elephant, and international arbitration is not a bad appellation for international arbitration. But let's remember what it is. Thank you.